I am going to take a moment, everyone, to create an opportunity today. My name is Troy Sangaro. I'm the Director of Commercial Public Trade. And for almost a week and a half now, in Copenhagen, the world's leaders and their negotiators have taken trying to come to an agreement on this session. I'm sure some of you have seen some of the news uh, over the last couple of days. The conference itself has been nicknamed Constant Hagen by some. Um, but one of the things that is very interesting about the climate change issue that all of us talked about in our discussions with plenty of is that Northeast Asia and the United States have a very significant role to play, both in terms of the emissions that some of the countries emit and in terms of the technologies and the ways that they can address this issue. And I think we have a very excellent panel to discuss these issues. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to John Lyman from the Atlantic Council for the Monterey today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, I would not uh, claim that I'm a, a climate expert, although as Director of Energy and Environment Program at the Atlantic Council, we've been working for a number of years on the whole question of U.S. cooperation with countries like India, China, and Europe on technologies and what can be done to reduce emissions of all kinds and what we can be done to create a more secure and stable energy security in the world. Include in our minds not only environmental matters but also physical security and economic growth as well. So that's sort of my background. I have, we have been very active in China, which is the first speaker we've been talking to the which recently just turned out a publication on U.S. Uh, uh, Chinese cooperation on nuclear power, which is up on the website. And we're turning out one this week on U.S. China cooperation on coal technology. So we've been holding dialogue with the Chinese now for about 10 years. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Griffin Thompson, who's going to be our lead off speaker. Uh, Griffin has a very distinguished career, and we've seen from the right up in front of me, so I don't need to go over it all. But he is extremely active in the Asian Pacific Partnership, and he's been over the active in China and India on a regular basis. Um, this is really progress. So this is someone who's speaking not just from policy point of view as much as from real knowledge about what's happening physically. Uh, he's going to be giving a presentation from the podium. Uh, we would ask you to remind you that his comments are off the record. They will be not a copy of the PowerPoints afterwards. So thank you for the attention and information from the PowerPoints. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes for each presentation. The next speaker will be uh, David Comfort. Uh, David again has Lots of experience. Uh, he's currently Deputy Director of CSIS Energy and National Security Program. He's also had broad experience working for the Department of Energy. <coughs> thanks, thanks, John. Sounds good. Should I just speak louder? Okay. okay. Um, thanks, John, for the, the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And I, I thank the, the Korean Economic Institute, the Master of Foundation, and I guess I should my own institution, CSIS, for giving me the opportunity to be here. And it's, it's always great to share a panel with Griff because he has a, a great way of uh, presenting things, uh, though I, I must admit that uh, I'm wondering if it's because I left the Department of Energy is why things are going better in the interagency. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, at, at CSIS, the Energy and National Security Program, we've been working for the last uh, couple of years on the related questions of energy security and climate change. Um, looking, if you will, at the policy options that are present both uh, in the U.S. but internationally to come up with a, an energy policy framework that addresses both of these issues while maintaining um, economic growth. And so that's the, that's the whole new definition of, of energy security, is that you need to maintain economic growth, you need to have reliable energy systems, but you have to do that in a way that doesn't uh, damage uh, the environment or uh, have impacts on future generations. Um, today I'm going to talk on something that I haven't actually spent as much time on, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm uh, uh, just uh, some of this getting up to speed, which is uh, the Japanese uh, situation vis-a-vis -vis climate change and what's been going on there, as well as some thoughts, and this is perhaps a little more of what we've been doing, on the cooperation and collaboration in Northeast Asia and uh, in Northeast Asia and the United States. 
Uh, we have just started a project that actually uh, made this a, a great opportunity to talk about. It's under a grant we're beginning a project to look at what we're calling secure low carbon pathways. Um, and it's a project focused on uh, the US and Asia. So we're bringing in experts from uh, India, China, Japan, Korea, um, Taiwan, and the United States to begin to have that discussion and develop an understanding of what what does the future growth pattern for carbon emissions look like when you start taking into account the, the economic dimensions as well as the energy security dimensions? Um, and it, we're really looking forward to this project. We're going to actually begin um, some of the meetings under that project uh, early next year. So um, I'm at the front end of it, so I'm not able to give you any results um, from the work there. Um, Japan has been a very interesting country to watch um, as it comes to grips with a a new government, a party coming into power that has been on the outside for many years and for which most uh, analysts, the Japanese experts, describe as a party that was founded around opposition to uh, the Liberal Democratic Party. So the whole idea was this is a broad-based set of interests and ideas that wanted to see change. Now the question of coming to grips with where to go um, is the one that um, I know our Japanese analysts um, have been looking at closely, and I think climate change is one of the um, big issues. So sort of as a backdrop, um, Japan, um, as early as soon after the uh, first oil shock, really embarked on a uh, set strategy that is very consistent with this transformation to a low-carbon energy economy. Efficiency became a lead concern, a lead item, shifting away from the use of oil as a principal um, driver for the energy sector, emphasizing introduction of nuclear power, um, trying to reduce its dependency on the, on the globe. So as we began the climate change debate, Japan was already well down the pathway towards saying we need to be much more efficient, we need to be moving towards other types of fuels that are uh, low carbon. The, in Kyoto, they made a commitment to uh, reduce their emissions 6% below the 1990 level by this uh, commitment period that is just beginning, really. This is the second year of the commitment period. Um, and, and most of the reports that I'm seeing lately would say that they're going to achieve um, the objective of reaching that target of that um, 6% um, below the 1990 levels. Now, the reasons are, are mixed. Some of it is policy, some of it in terms of encouraging greater efficiency and the shift to other fuels. Uh, another part is the same way in which the U.S. has been lowering its emissions, which is a major recession and uh, the fall in economic output, especially in heavy industries, steel and other sectors, has driven down energy consumption and emissions overall, so that helps you get to your target. And the third way is very active participation in the clean development mechanism to be able to buy offsets and credits in, in other countries. So when you combine all of those areas, the actual reported emissions for Japan are likely to be in the range that was established under Kyoto. The real trick becomes um, what to do for the, the longer term, and especially the item that's under most discussion in Copenhagen right now, which is the midterm target. What's the midterm target to be? Um, uh, Prime Minister also had gone through a laborious process of consulting with industry, um, uh, NGOs, academics to come up with the level that he believed that Japan could make as a commitment, which was announced as a 15% below the 2005 level. And one of my favorite pet peeves here is the, the use of varying numbers and baselines. It's a, a wonderful way to obfuscate what is actually going on. So if I start uh, sounding irritated with the constant changing of baselines and things, that's the, I just wanted to give you do a warning that this is always a problem. So he chose, as the United States has chose, 2005 as a, a baseline. This was immediately criticized by many in the environmental community as being not enough. You got to do more. You got to do better than that. So I think Japanese industry was feeling like, okay, we're glad you selected that rather than the higher option, which was, I believe, closer to the option that the new prime minister, Hatayama, had ended up selecting. Now, one important distinction in that number was that this was based solely on uh, emissions reductions within the Japanese economy. So it wasn't taking credit for international emissions. Um, which, as I mentioned earlier, has been one of the ways to reach the 
Kyoto targets. Um, as everyone knows, the story evolved, and uh, um, we had a change of government. Prime Minister uh, Hatoyama came in and immediately 